and we will get started. Okay, what's the name of the Torah portion today? Ha'azinu. You see that up uh, on the screen? Um, I made that little scroll, and it says Ha'azinu. And Ha'azinu means listen up, <clears throat> give ear, listen to me. And what's amazing, this is the song of Moses that the book of Revelation says we'll be singing. So when it says they'll sing the song of Moses, this is what it's talking about. And the book of Deuteronomy is equivalent to the book of Revelation, okay? It's the last book of the New Testament. Deuteronomy is the last book of the Torah. This is the last chapters of the Torah. And <clears throat> Moses, this is, happens all within like 37 days. And Moses is encapsulizing everything that's happened through the wilderness, and he renews the covenant with this new generation. So we're going to begin with uh, Deuteronomy 31.30 from last week because it ties into this. It says, Moses spoke in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. One thing that I, I've been to Israel over 25 times and uh, many times I go, I go to the schools, uh, our whole tour group uh, that is with us goes into the schools in Shiloh or Shiloh as Christians know it. And we hear them learning in the schools and you go in and they have their Bibles open and it doesn't matter where they are in the Torah, they sing it. This is how they memorize the whole Torah. They turn it all into song. And so God wanted them to remember this song, he says, because in the last days, you're going to sing it and it's all going to become clear. And then now we begin our Torah portion in Deuteronomy 32, 1, it says, give ear, but who's supposed to give ear? Not only Israel, it says, give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak, and you give ear, O earth the words of my mouth. Wow, I didn't know heavens and earth had ears. But guess what? They hear. How many of you ever heard of sound waves? Sound waves go everywhere. We're hearing things from stars thousands of miles away. We listen to stars. Well, God says everything has to be done with the mouth of two witnesses. And so, the two, heavenly court, and it's amazing, this is always at the same time of Rosh Hashanah when the doors are open, the court is in session, and here we're seeing this is a court scene, and he's having the heavens and the earth even testify and to hear what he's saying. So he's calling the heavenly witnesses to the heavenly court, and what is he wanting them to bear witness to his faithfulness in particular to Israel. God is trying to say, look, what have I done to you? In Micah 6, God says, what have I done to you? Testify against me. What, what have I done that you turned from me? Well, let's look at Deuteronomy 32 and verse three, and four, but I want you to see here. Uh, here I have the universe, so to speak, and he's calling for the heavens and the earth to listen, and you're going to find out in this Song of Moses, you, I really want you to pay attention because this is going to come back in the future here. God is called the rock, and I don't mean a little rock, a massive rock, like the rock of Gibraltar that's immovable. He's called great. His works are perfect. His ways are judgment. He is true. He is just. And he is right. How many of you would call God a liar? I don't think so. So let's look at this. Because I will publish the name of the Lord ascribe you greatness to our God. He is the rock, not Peter. His work is perfect. All of his ways are judgment. 
He is a God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. Wow. Now, let's jump to Revelation chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. What are we going to be singing? The song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. That doesn't mean two different songs. It means the song of Moses is the song of the Lamb. And look what they're going to be saying. <clears throat> Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, you King of saints. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? You only are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you, for your <clears throat> judgments are made manifest. Do you see that? Do you see the comparison to Deuteronomy? Well, what else is in Revelation 13, 9? If any man have an ear to hear, let him hear. That's ha'azinu. Most people, believers, don't even know this is referring continually back to Deuteronomy 32. Revelation and Deuteronomy 32 go hand in hand. Now, let's look at Psalms 19, verse 1 and 4. What do the heavens do? They declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day is pouring out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. And then it says there is no speech or language, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. What that means is like solar lunar eclipses speak in every language, nation, and tongue. All of the heavens are showing the glory of God to the entire world. <clears throat> now, look at Psalm 148, verse 3 and 5. Praise you him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens and you waters that are above the heavens. Now, wait a minute. How can the sun and the moon verbalize praise. It says, praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars. We have to realize all the creatures above and below have a voice. Look at this. <clears throat> oh, and then let, let me go over one more thing. Okay, praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you what? Heavens of heavens. There are seven heavens. We know the Apostle Paul went to the third heaven, but most people don't realize there are seven heavens, all with different Hebrew names, and we have them on a handout downstairs. <clears throat> but that's why it says the heavens of heavens, and the heavens declare, because there's more than one heaven. Now, if we go to Revelation chapter 5, this is amazing to me. Verse 11 through 13. I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round the throne. And look at this. And the beasts and the elders, <clears throat> and look at the number of them. It was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And look at what they're saying with a loud voice. I can just hear them yelling, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then look at this. Every creature that's in heaven, every creature on the earth, every creature under the earth, every creature in the sea and all that are in them, I also heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Can you imagine all the whales, all the salmon, Every living thing is going to be proclaiming the glory of God. Now, this verse, many don't know, comes from the book of Daniel. Wow, a lot of times we don't make the association. We just got done reading about 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Well, it's all in the book of Daniel. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, 
and verse 5, you have to remember, this whole chapter speaks of the last days. This chapter speaks of the last days. And what does it say? They have dealt corruptly with him. That means the children of Israel have dealt corruptly with their father. And then it says they are not his children. How many of you have ever had your kids do something wrong and you turn to your spouse and say, they're your kid? That's your kid. That's not my kid. Okay. And then when they do good, that's my kid, <laughs> not your kid. Well, here we see God said concerning the nation of Israel at the Exodus, they are a perverse and crooked generation. Can you imagine the very generation that saw all the miracles, the plagues, the waters of the Red Sea splitting? Of all people, they should have been the children of faith. But you have to understand, miracles never produce faith. I'll never forget when I was working at a Christian bookstore up in Federal Way, and this person came up and they uh, wanted to, for me to pray that their child would see a miracle so he'd believe. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Just because, and the problem is, it will when the Antichrist does miracles. Here, God does all these miracles, and people are faithless, and yet the Antichrist will do miracles, and everyone's going to believe him. It's just insane. But the generation of the greatest miracles in history was a perverse and crooked generation. Now look at Matthew 17, 17. This is the generation when Yeshua himself was here. And Yeshua answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. Amazing. Yeshua is there, the Messiah, doing all kinds of miracles. And he said that generation. And then he says in another verse, when I return, will I find faith on earth? This almost implies the generation before his return will also be a crooked and perverse generation. And look at the generation we are in. But we're to be light in the darkness. Now, um, let me ask you something. This isn't on my notes, but it just came to my mind. How many of your people think or say that if uh, God himself was right here, we'd act differently. Okay, in some se sense, yes. But this is going to be mind-blowing. Do you realize for 1,000 years, when the Lord does return, for 1,000 years, he will physically be here on earth ruling and reigning, and yet at the very end, all the nations are going to come against him again in the final Gog Magog war. Even though they were in his presence, they were under his administration, not for 100 years, not for 200 years, for 1,000 years, God himself will be on earth and the people aren't going to trust him. They'll be faithless and perverse. Wow. And the reason why this is important too is there's a big misunderstanding among people that when there's the new heavens and the new earth, the world, the flesh, the devil are all gone, which are our main temptations. But guess what? We will still have a free will and we will still be able to sin. Now, I can prove that from the Bible as well as logic. If we can't sin, we become AI robots. I love you. I love you. What good is that? He wants people who love him with his own free will. So you know how he's going to control or um, be in charge of all of this? Okay? It's because, first off, we won't have the world, the flesh, or the devil to bug us. So that will be removed. But it says in the very last verse of Isaiah 66, the last chapter, the last verse, it says, after the new heavens and earth that I make, everyone gets to come every week, every month, and look into hell. That's what it says. Go to Isaiah 66. Look at the last chapter, the last verse. And God says, guess what, guys? Every week, every month, everyone gets to go look into the hell. And just to motivate you, don't touch that. Don't do that. We will have a free will. 
Okay, I got off topic. Now, something else I want to point out here. Okay, we've been going through the Song of Moses. Now, look at Deuteronomy 32, 6. It says, do you do this to the yud Hey, Bob, hey, that's God. You, he's saying, you're doing this to me, oh foolish and unwise people. Is he not your father who bought you, who created you, who established you? This is the very first time in the Bible that God is referred to as your father. And look how he's treated. He says, look, I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who established you. I'm the one who paid to get you out of Egypt, and you're going to treat me this way? Well, here's what's fascinating. In Hebrew, you never see this in English. This is only in Hebrew, where it says to the Lord you're going to act this way. There's a giant letter, hey. See, this is the normal size, but there's this giant letter, hey, that is in this verse. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, you have to understand what the letter He means. And guess what? The letter He is used twice in God's name. The Yud, He, Vav, He. And here the He is made real big. I want to compare that to another verse in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And we're going to find in Genesis 2, 4, when it says the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created... Well, right here is where that is, and I want you to notice the normal-sized hay, but all of a sudden, the hay is very small. Why is that hay made real small? Okay, well, here's the explanation. In Genesis, the hay is made small. It says, in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven... And in one sense, Satan fell, rebelled against God, trying to diminish the glory of God. But in Deuteronomy, the glory is coming back in a, such a greater way in spite of what happened in the beginning. The letter He means behold or to reveal. And we see, as I said, in God's name, it's the letter He, which means to behold or to reveal. Now, let's go look at uh, Psalm 89, 26 and 29. God says, he will cry to me, you are my dad, you're my father. Just like the child will cry out to his father. He says, you're my God and the rock of my salvation. This is referring back to Deuteronomy 32. And then it says, also, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. My covenant will stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. In other words, David's seed, the Judah, the Jewish people are going to be around forever as the days of heaven. Look at how Psalms 89 continues. In verse 30 through 36, if David's children forsake my Torah, they don't walk in my judgments. If they break my statutes, they don't keep my commandments. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. They'll get a spanking. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take away from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail my covenant. I will not break nor alter what has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever in his throne as the sun before me. And yet we see in the Psalms, Amalek says, I want to make his seed be gone forever. This is a direct war against God, even what is going on right now. But as long as there's a sun, the whole purpose, when we see the moon and the sun, what we're to think of is the Jews will never leave. The Jews will never be utterly destroyed. That's what the sun and the moon tell us. Every time we look at it, it should remind us 
of God's covenant to Israel. This is why replacement theology is so bad, and you think God replaced Israel with us Christians. You're saying God's a liar. And look at this. In Deuteronomy 32.10, it says God found Israel in a desert land, in the waste howling wilderness, but God led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. His whole focus is on Israel. When you poke Israel, you're poking God in the eye. Not a good idea. Here's the book. The problem was with Israel in Deuteronomy 32, 15 through 18. It says Yeshurun, which is like a nickname for his kids. And what happened? He waxed fat and he started kicking. You are waxing fat. You're grown thick, like thick headed. You are covered with fatness. And what happens when everything is awesome? How many of you know you don't repent in the good times? People repent in the bad times. And here it says, when he got successful, he forsook God who made him and he lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. That's what it says in Deuteronomy. Now look at this. They provoked God to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. Look what they did. They were actually were sacrificing to devils and not gods. Gods they didn't know, new gods that newly came up, whom you fathers feared not. And here again, of the rock that begot you, you are unmindful and have forgotten God who formed you. Wow. If you've forgotten something, that means you haven't been thinking about it for a long time, which means you're not really in relationship. How many of you know people who are in a relationship only for what they can get out of the relationship? And once that is gone, they leave the relationship because it's all about them. Isaiah 1, verse 2 and 3 also relates back to Deuteronomy 32. It says, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I've nourished and brought up children, and they've rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people don't even consider. God gets more upset at his kids than he does the heathen. The heathen act a certain way, but you expect them to act that way. His problem is never with the heathen. It's always with his own people that don't do what he says. So let's look at Zechariah. Can you see this same theme being repeated all throughout the Bible? One thing I love to do is look for the patterns because we can learn from patterns. Oh, I'm here. I'm going to show you a picture here. I don't know how many of you ever talked to somebody and they did that. Look at Zechariah 7, 11 through 13. But they refused to listen. They pulled away the shoulder. They stopped their ears that they won't hear. They made their hearts as hard as a rock, lest they should hear the Torah, the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit. The spirit and the law go together, guys, by the former prophets. This is why great wrath came from the Lord of armies. Therefore, it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cry and I will not hear, says the Lord. That's exactly what the Song of Songs is all about that I've been going over the last several weeks. We see a pattern throughout the whole Bible. Look at Jeremiah 6, 16 through 19. Thus says the Lord, stand in the way and see and ask for which paths. The old paths, that is the good way. This is why Yeshua is the way, and he's trying to restore the old paths. He says, walk there, and you will find rest for your souls. Do you know this verse is quoted in Matthew? That's what it is. I think it's 1129. And he says, you know, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and you will find rest for your souls. It comes from here. But then look what happens. They said, we don't want to walk that way. So God says, okay, fine. I'm going to set a watchman over you saying, listen to the sound of the shofar, like Rosh Hashanah, 
But what did they say? We will not listen. That's under the law. That's the Old Testament. We don't have to listen to the shofar. Therefore, it says, Hear, O nations, and no congregation, what is among them. Hear, earth, behold, I'm going to bring evil on this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not listened to my words. And as for my Torah, they have rejected it. Again, this is why it is serious to reject the Torah. Look what happens then in Deuteronomy 32, verse 20 and 21. And God says, therefore, I'm going to hide my face. How many of you want God to hide his face from you? Ooh, not good, not good. He says, I'm going to see what their end will be, for they are a very perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. They moved me to jealousy with that which is not a God. They provoked me to anger with their vanities. And so look at what God says to Israel. I will move them to jealousy with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Wow, here is their living God, and here is a fake God. And they're worshiping the fake God and not the real God. So God says, therefore, I'm going to have a no-nothing nation, a foolish nation, okay? And I'm going to have them anger you. And what's going to anger them is the fact that Wow, here are people that aren't his, weren't his father, but now they're acting like he is their father. Let's watch how this happens. Romans 10, 19 and 20 quotes this verse. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses said, here it is. It's quoting the verse we just read. I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are a no people and by a foolish nation, I'm going to anger you. But Isaiah is even very bold. And he said, I was found of them that weren't even looking for me. I was made manifest to them that weren't even asking for me. That's referring to the Gentiles. All of a sudden, God reveals himself to them. <clears throat> and then it says <clears throat> in Romans 11, 11 and 12, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid. It's rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. That's the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 32. Okay, and then it says, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness or when they mature and they come back. The problem, the church has never in 2,000 years been provoking Israel to jealousy. We've only been provoking them to anger. Let me explain. How do you make someone jealous of something? I can tell you. It happened when I was four years old. I'm four years old. I got the coolest tricycle in the world, bright red, I'm taking that thing all around, and I just beat the bejeebies out of it, out in the rain, rusted and everything else. And I think a wheel came off, and I threw it in the trash. Well, the guy who picks up the trash is like four houses down. He has a bunch of kids, so he goes in the alleyway when we have the old burn barrels, not the big fancy ones now. And he takes my tricycle out, and he gives it to his son after he's painted it, put on a new wheel, made it look fantastic, and I see his four-year-old son driving my tricycle, and it's like, give me that. I was jealous. I want that back. That was mine. What's going to make the Jews jealous is when believers start following and doing what God says, keeping the Sabbath, keeping the feast. There are a lot of Jews that are so upset that Gentiles are keeping the Sabbath. That's ours. It's not yours. Why are you keeping that? That's how you make the Jews jealous. They don't want any of the paganism we got. That's not going to make them jealous. We have to understand what it means to make them jealous. Okay, now. Uh, let's see. We're going to jump over. I'm having too much fun. Okay, now look at Jeremiah 16, 19. This is what the Gentiles are going to say. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, 
the Gentiles are going to come to you from the ends of the earth and they're going to say, surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Wow. And then look at Deuteronomy 32, 26 and 27. I said I'm going to scatter them into the corners. See, Deuteronomy 32, this is speaking about these last 2,000 years. I would make the remembrance of them to cease. Now, they're not going to cease, but the remembrance of them is going to cease for the last 2,000 years. <clears throat> and then he says, were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, unless they say, our hand is high, and the Lord has not done all this. And in other words, we're the ones who destroyed Israel, not God. God says, look, I'm going to scatter them and destroy them, but not completely because they haven't obeyed me. And I don't want you nations to think that you were able to do this. And then in Deuteronomy 32, 29, the next verse says, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. And then verse 30 and 31, how in the world could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had set them up. Their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies themselves being judges. They all know that the God of Israel was much more powerful than their gods. And then we see this heavenly sword being talked about. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 41 and 42. God says, if I sharpen my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies. I will reward them that hate me I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword will devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges on the enemy. So remember, this is the book of Revelation <clears throat> and God is saying there's a time coming when I'm going to render vengeance to all my enemies. Big time. Well, look at Revelation 19, 15. Out of his mouth goes what? A sharp sword. And with it, he's going to smite the nations. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. A war is coming from the heavens that we cannot put off. It's coming. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 43. Look what it says to do. Rejoice, O you nations, with his people. There is only one festival where God commands Israel to rejoice. When is it? The coat, the Feast of Tabernacles. Can you imagine a commandment? I want you to be happy. And you have to be happy for a whole week. No grumpy grumpies. And it says that he is going to avenge the blood of his servants. That sounds like the book of Revelation. No kidding. He will render vengeance to his adversaries. He will be merciful, though, to his land and to his people. We'll look at Revelation 19, 2. Again, referring back to Ha'azinu. True and righteous are his judgments, for he's finally judged the great whore which corrupted the earth with her fornication, and now he has finally avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. This is a direct reference to the Song of Moses, why we have to make these connections to get the full picture. <clears throat> but look, even the Apostle Paul quoted the Song of Moses about rejoicing with his people, which is referring to the time of Sukkot. It says in Romans <clears throat> 15, 8 through 12, now I say that Messiah, <clears throat> excuse me, has made a servant of the circumcision for the truth of God that he might confirm his promises that were given to the fathers and that the Gentiles will glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, will I give praise to you among the Gentiles and sing, here's that song of Moses to your name. Again, he says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. Again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the nations praise him. And Isaiah even says, there will be the root of Jesse who arises to rule over the Gentiles and in him will the Gentiles hope. Again, you can see it's connected right back to the song of Moses. And then our final verse is Deuteronomy 34, 10 through 12, where it says, there's not arisen a prophet in all of Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord who face to face 
and all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his servants, and to all his land, and in all the mighty hand, and all the great terror which Moses wrought in the sight of all. And that ends the Song of Moses. And uh, yeah, next Shabbat, again, we're not going to be here, but we are going to be here next Friday night for the Yom Kippur service. And then the next week, I believe we'll finish the Torah uh, with uh, the Zot Habraka. And we'll talk about Shemini Yatzeret, which means the eighth day. With that, let's stand. But I hope this helps you get a better understanding and the importance of seeing the connections between the Brit Hadashah or New Testament and the Tanakh, how God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for everything you're doing in each of our lives. I pray you truly would give us Ha'azinu, an ear to hear, not only to hear, but to understand. We want understanding. If we're going to be able to stand in these days, only if we know that you're the one at the helm will we have the confidence and trust in you. So I pray each one of us will get that deep within our hearts. Father, I thank you for all those that are here locally, for all those that are all around the United States watching right now, as well as those all over the world. Father, we just thank you for those who sow into your ministry. We know in Isaiah, it says, your goal is to magnify the Torah and make it honorable once again. And that's what we want to do. So I thank you for all those who donate uh, into your work through us because that's what we want. It's not our work. It's your work that you're working through us to magnify who you are. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. <clears throat> you have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay. Are you ready? What we're going to do, we're going to finish the book, The Song of Songs, today. Now, how many of you see it a little bit differently so far? Uh, it's amazing. So we have to understand it is like a play. And where we are is in the fifth act, which is chapter 6, verse 11, through chapter 8, verse 4. And here we're going to see, she finally wakes up. She's working the harvest. If you remember in the beginning, she didn't want to go. Twice he comes, he calls her, she tells him to take a hike. The second time she's sleeping, he's pounding on the door and she says, do I have to get my feet dirty? You know, and he leaves. Well, this time she finally has matured and she's actually working the harvest. But then she falls asleep again. But it's okay because this time when she falls asleep, it's from all of her hard work, not from being just lazy. And the Song of Songs, what I want everyone to really understand is actually a story about returning to God as our king and not wanting a human king. You know, how many of you like having a president or a king? Uh, how many of you know man is pretty fickle? Okay, this is why we want to return to God as our king. And so we find here in Act 5, see, actually, the Shulamite joins her beloved, the shepherd, and works the harvest. So here now, in chapter 7 is where we are, verse 1. The shepherd is talking to the Shulamite, or the groom to the soon-to-be bride. And she says, how beautiful are your feet. With shoes, O prince's daughter, the joints of your thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. What is he talking about when he says, how beautiful are your feet? Well, let's look at Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7 and 8. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings. And do you know what the Hebrew word for good tidings is? Basora. And it means the good news. So here in Isaiah, it's talking about the good news in the gospel that publishes peace, that brings the good news of good. 
that publishes salvation and that tells Zion, guess what? Your God reigns. The watchman will lift up the voice. Remember the watchman in the Song of Songs? They beat her. All right. But this time we see that the watchman will lift up the voice with the voice together. Shall they sing for they're finally going to see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Here's the thing. We want to be able to see eye to eye. How many of you know the New Testament says we see through a glass darkly? We only know in part. That tells us the church is blinded in one eye. Romans 11 says the Jews were only blinded, partially blinded. So it's like the Jews are blinded in one eye, the church is blinded in one eye, and the first group to literally humble themselves and look out of both lenses gets to see the whole picture, which is why I have a real great relationship with the Jewish people. I learned from them. I have a real good relationship with all the churches. I learned from them. But when you put them both together, the Bible becomes full color, 3D. It's like you have these glasses on, you wear it to movies, and everything is 3D all of a sudden. And that makes a huge difference. So now the shepherd continues to address the Shulamite in chapter 7, verse 2 through 4. And he says, your navel is like a round goblet that doesn't want liquor. Your belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Your two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Your neck is as a tower of ivory. Your eyes like the fish pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bat Robin. Robin. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon that looks toward Damascus. Now, how many of you ladies would be impressed if someone says your nose is like the tower of Lebanon? Okay, but that's really not a bad thing. Do you remember the picture I showed you the other day where a hair was as a flock of goats and uh, all of that? Okay, kind of moving on that same line here. But what does that mean to have a nose like the Tower of Lebanon? Did you know one of the blemishes? It's in Leviticus. It mentions the blemishes. If a priest had, they couldn't do the work of the priest until the blemish was healed. One of the blemishes was to have a flat nose. What? <laughs> What's the deal with the blemish being a flat nose? And here the bride has a, t a nose like the Tower of Lebanon that looks toward Damascus. Here's what it is. How many of you ever heard, I smell a rat? Something smells fishy in Denmark. Okay. Having a nose like the Tower of Lebanon means she has great discernment. It's saying, I can smell something. How many of you know so often the women have discernment that the men don't have? The men are working the field, doing their thing. They're caught up in what they're doing. And the wife comes along and says, something's not right here. This is what we have to listen to uh, the females in our lives. I had five older sisters that taught me this. But look at what the Bible says in Job 27, 1 through 3. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God lives, who's taken away my judgment, and the Almighty, who has vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is where? In my nose. The Spirit of God is bringing discernment. Look at Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For when... For the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that someone teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's a baby, but strong meat belongs to them who are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So having a big nose, and where's this nose looking? Toward Damascus. That's where the enemy is. How many of you know in this big war, October 7th, it was the women that was warning, and the men just brushed it off. That is huge. And so we have to understand, and even in this, we know about the milk of the word. Milk is good, but the problem is you don't have any teeth. You can't eat meat. Okay, so God wants us to grow up from being a baby. 
How many churches you have to get saved every week? It doesn't even make sense. Let's get off the milk and cookies and let's give us some meat and potatoes. Okay, but it's by reason of use. I think it's, again, they have to reteach them the baby stuff over and over and over. We're supposed to grow. And then the shepherd continues in the Song of Songs, chapter 7, verse 5 through 8. He's describing her, and he says, your head is like Carmel. There's a Carmel ridge up by Haifa. Uh, and it says, the hair of your head like purple. <laughs> she must have dyed a purple streak in her hair. No, I'm kidding. The king is held captive in the tresses thereof. How fair and how pleasant are you, O love for delights. Your stature is like a palm tree. Your breast are clusters of grapes. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I'll take hold of the bows. Now also your breasts will be as the clusters of the vine and the smell of your nose like what? Apples. Well, if you remember apples and the palm trees refers to the Feast of Tabernacles. These, are, these things they're speaking about refer to the festivals. And here, if you remember, what did we find in chapter 2, verse 3? She describes him like an apple tree. Okay? So she's participating in like the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? The apples among, she compared him to an apple tree among the trees of the woods. She says, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. And we know, taste and see that the Lord is good, and the word of God is compared to food. But watch this. The Shulamite then says in verse 9, the roof of your mouth like the best wine for my beloved that goes down sweetly, causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak. Remember in chapter 5, she was sleeping, but she said, my heart was awake. She was like uh, at the point of death, and then his word and his beating on the door wakes her up, and the word do there always refers to the resurrection of the dead. When she says, the lips of those that are asleep to speak, it is the Messiah who brings about the resurrection of the dead, as they hear his voice calling. They will arise, and what are they going to do? They're going to sing his praises. Uh, now, here's the other thing. Do you remember earlier, she said, my beloved is mine, and I am his. In other words, you belong to me first, and then I belong to you. And then as he matures, it goes from that reversed to I belong to him and he is mine. And then she matures even more. And because she makes no claim on him, she says, I am my beloved's and his desire is towards me. So the, when, even when it talks about the fullness of the Gentiles, that's not a number. That's maturity. God is waiting for the church to mature, to grow up, not be so narcissistic and always thinking about uh, they want to get saved because they want to go to heaven and don't want to go to hell, not because they want a relationship with God. And so here you see how she progresses in her walk. So we see in chapter 7, verse 10 through 13, I am my beloved. His desire is now toward me. Now look what she finally says. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine Flourish, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth, there will I give you my love. Now, isn't that fascinating that all of a sudden it's not you go do it and I'm going to stay here in the four walls and rest. She says, let's get up early. Let's get to work. And it's now us. It's not you. In the, one of the first chapters, she goes, our bed is green. And the next chapter, it's my bed. It's no longer our bed. And so we see, again, this progression of her maturity. And do you remember what it said? Uh, she says, let us see if the vine flourish. Do you remember from several weeks ago, she's in bed. She slept all winter. She went into hibernation, you know, 
Arise, my love, my fair one, I come away for lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. And he says, we need to go see if the vine is flourishing because the foxes are spoiling the vine. And who were the foxes? Who were the foxes? Test, quiz, the false prophets. Ezekiel calls foxes are the false prophets. So this is why you always want to let the Bible interpret itself. And she didn't want to go. We know from Isaiah 5, Israel's the vineyard. And remember from Song of Songs once, he says, my own vineyard, I haven't been taken care of. So now all of a sudden, she wants to get to work and look at this. And how many of you know, God says, if you love me, you'll obey me. So that's why she says, in the field, I'll give you my love. Because now I'm not just speaking it, I'm showing it. So she says, let us get up early. And then she says, the mandrakes give a good smell at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old. Oh my goodness, that sounds like the verse I spoke, talked about in the first half about the storeroom, uh, you know, who brings out of his treasure both new and old. Those things are coming from this verse, which I have laid up for you, O oh my beloved. I think it's great. She's not only rising early, but I think she's also, we see, she's keeping the feasts. Now, we, here's the Hebrew, the uh, Hebrew Heritage Bible, New Testament, is going to give you Matthew 13, 52, that I read earlier at the opening. It says, so Yeshua told them, for this cause, every scribe who has become a trained disciple of the kingdom of heaven resembles an owner of property who brings out of his treasure, stores things, new and old. So when you connect that to the Song of Songs, you can get a better understanding of what that means. And then look how she responds in chapter 8, which is the last chapter, verse 1 through 3. She says, Oh, that you were like my brother, who nursed at my mother's breast. If I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. I would lead you and bring you to the house of my mother, she who used to instruct me. I, I don't know if you remember, but it's in Proverbs where it says, forsake not the instruction of your mother and refers to the Torah being a chain or a necklace around her neck. But now look at this. It says, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. So who's laying down? She is. Okay, this is where the King James is always wrong. And I'll show you in the next verse. But here she's falling asleep again. But realize this time she's falling asleep because she got up early. She's working the harvest. And then the shepherd now speaks to the daughters of Jerusalem. And he says, I've adjured you, O daughters of Jerusalem, how you stir up and how you wake my love till she please. Now, in King James, it says until he please as if he's the one who's asleep. But we know God never sleeps or slumbers. This is the Young's literal translation, which has it correct as she please. Okay, so now here we come to the last act. This is Act 6, which is chapter 8, verse 5 through eight fourteen. We see now she also has concern for others. And just like this morning's Torah portion, Ha'azinu, she has ears to hear. And so what happens? Uh, in Act 6, she now enjoys full communion with the shepherd. She's totally sanctified. She's set apart. Now, here's what's amazing. Do you remember in the other chapter where their daughter's Jerusalem is saying, who is this coming up out of the wilderness with pillars of smoke? And remember that was Solomon? And he had all these soldiers about him because of fear in the night. And who is he pursuing in the middle of the night? Solomon was a predator. He, here he's pursuing the daughters of Jerusalem. But the bridegroom says, I could care less about the daughters of Jerusalem. I only want Jerusalem. Okay. Now watch what happens this time. In chapter 8, verse 5, the daughters of Jerusalem say, Who is this that comes up from the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? And so this time it's not Solomon. 
It's the bride and the groom. And she's leaning on her beloved coming up out of the wilderness. If you remember, I told you the book of Hosea goes with the Song of Songs. And look what it says in Hosea chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Therefore, behold, God says, I will allure her, Israel, and I will bring her where? Into the wilderness. There I will speak tenderly to her. There I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Acor door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. Okay, she comes out of the land of Egypt and they are engaged for the wedding. He is her king. And then she leaves. She wants nothing to do with him. They, she wants a king like all the nations have. But now through her maturity, she's giving up the human king and coming back to God as her king. And so then we find the shepherd addresses the Shulamite or the group of the bride. And look at what he says. I awakened you where? Okay, he represents the apple tree. All the fruit comes from him. And this time she fell asleep, but she fell asleep not off in the desert somewhere, but under the actual apple tree. And it says, this is where your mother travailed with you. There she travailed and bore you. You remember who her mother was? A Hittite. Remember, at the formation of Jerusalem. So we come back to the birth of Jerusalem. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 4 through 8. It says, as for your nativity, referring to Jerusalem, on the day you were born, your navel cord wasn't even cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But instead, you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. How many of you would like to have your parents really hate the fact that you were born? I think a lot of times people have problems because of the, their life, their history, their story of things that happen. And then look what it says. God says, when I passed by you and I saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field. You grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again, I looked upon you. Indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you. Remember Boaz? Okay. And I looked upon you. Indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you, covered your nakedness. I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. So in one sense, live. God is crying out, Am Yisrael Chai. Okay, the people of Israel live. This is where they get that from. And so now the shepherd is urging the bride to be in a call to action. And look at what he says. How many remember the Shema? Okay, put it as a seal. Okay. He says, set me as a seal where? On your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Okay, this is very passionate love. And he says, many waters can't quench love, nor can floods drown it. You would think a flood could drown a fire, but this is an external. The passion for God is in our heart. We don't serve God now because we're afraid of punishment. We don't serve God now uh, because we want a big reward. We are to become passionately in love with God. This is something that goes beyond the physical. And then he says, if a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. So we need to remember God is a consuming fire and he is a jealous God. And look at how the Shulamite now responds. You'll see now she's not focused on herself. She's now focused on others. And she says, we 
have a little sister. She has no breast. What we do for our sister in the day when she is spoken for. What this is meaning is she is not yet of marriageable age. And she wants to know how her little sister should be preparing for that day. But we see the Shulamite is now secure enough and mature enough that she can now think about others. So let's go to verse 9. Look what the shepherd answers. I got a nice little picture here for you. He says, if she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she's a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Well, what does it mean she's like a wall? How about letting the Bible interpret itself? 1 Samuel 25, 15 and 16. It says, the men were very good to us and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. They were a wall, both night and day, all the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. The Hebrew word choma means a wall of protection. In other words, if she's mature, if she's solid, if she's immovable, we're going to make sure she stays that way. But what about a door? Well, in Proverbs 26, 14, it says a door, as a door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. Well, that was the bride earlier in the book of Song of Songs. She was the door with no stability, but now she's become a wall and she's concerned the little sister is going to be like her at the first rather than solid like she is now as a wall. And so here she says in verse 10, I am a wall. OK, I finally matured my breast like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. And that's internal peace. She has peace within herself. She has no conflict in who she is. She's now fully mature and she's able to feed the young. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So we're supposed to be steadfast. We're supposed to be immovable, but we're abounding in the work of the Lord or the Lord's work. The problem is, I said before, too many of us want to do what we want to do for God. Look what I've done for you, God. That's not what he wants. He wants to do his work through you. He has things he needs to get done and he needs people who are going to do what he wants to get done rather than what they want to get done. And so then look at this. Look how she responds in verse 11 and 12. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He leased it, the vineyard to keepers. And everyone had to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. My own vineyard, though, is before me. In other words, Solomon doesn't own her vineyard. It's my vineyard. And it says, oh, Solomon, you may have a thousand vineyards and those who tend its fruit 200. But guess what? I own this vineyard. And here we see King Solomon is back in the picture. And what is he being sure to do? Tax everybody. That's his goal. And Samuel had warned them of this type of a future king. He felt all the fields belonged to him. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 14 through 17. It says, if you have a king, here's what he's going to do. He's going to take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, and they're gonna, he's going to give them to his servants. Oh, he'll take a tenth of your grain and your vintage. The IRS wants 30%. They're worse than Solomon. And give it to his officers and servants. And he's going to take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, your donkeys, and put them to his work. He'll take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And so we see the Shulamite makes the comment indirectly to Solomon that he may have a thousand vineyards, but the one she has is all hers and she can't he can't touch it. No, 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 no. Can't touch this. OK. So now look how he responds. He goes, you who dwell where? OK. She's not in the house behind the four walls hiding. No, instead, she lives where she works. She's in the garden. She's full time working. And so in one sense now, look at this. 
Look at what he says to her. You who dwell in the gardens, your companions listen for your voice. Let me hear it. God wants to hear her. God wants to hear from you. Every single one of you, God, in one sense, is begging to hear your voice. This is powerful. Do you remember in the other chapter, this is back to the very beginning of this book. He says, Yo, your eyes are like doves. You know, I want to hear your voice. But she's hiding under the stairs, not wanting to be seen, not wanting to be heard. And he says, look, I love to hear your voice. Oh, you know, God loves to hear your voice. He loves to hear you. Don't think of prayer as just, you know, I grew up Catholic, you know, just the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Glory Be and I'm good. No, that's not what prayer is. It's prayer like when you talk to your friend. And that's what is so important. God's our best friend. We have to under... Now, he is also king. He's also judge, but he's also our dad. He's also our best friend. Uh, he's whatever we need at the time. And we need to realize he wants to hear you. Here it is. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 14. He says, Oh, my death, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. He wants to hear her voice. So I think it's interesting. This takes us back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve. He goes, Adam, Eve, where are you? Now, he knew where they were, but he was wanting to hear what they had to say. He wanted to spend time with them. And then what's amazing, Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 14. What is the bride respond or the Shulamite? She says, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. Do you remember the very first time she tells him to take a hike like on the mountains of Bether, which means separation, but now she knows he has to go to the mountain of spices, which speaks of Moriah, his death. For her, how much more can he show love for his bride than to lay down uh, his life? And so we see in Micah 4.2, many nations are going to come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, we'll walk in his paths, for out of Zion, the Torah or instruction will go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so as we close this book, I just pray that we can all gain new revelation and be prepared for the prophetic time in these last days when all of us are soon going to be gathering in Jerusalem. All right? But isn't it amazing when you look at the Song of Songs from a whole different perspective, you can see what it is really about. I love looking for patterns, and I'm so glad you guys like that too. So let's stand.